And if at any point I forget to switch on the recording, please remind me because sometimes I do forget these things. Yeah. So uh, we were looking at the importance of holiness in even being able to serve God in any capacity. And uh, so why it would be important for us to walk a holy life. And one question that was raised is, what if a person chooses never to walk in holiness? What if they just choose to uh, you know, live as they wish, according to the flesh? Um, then uh, would they go to heaven? Um, just to go back uh, to that weak example which we used. So it's not a very strong example, but it's a weak example. The example we used of the child, you know, the with the uh, learning disability. The teacher gave that child a second chance uh, to be able to reach his full potential. Uh, now the child, you know, looks at the marks card and says, oh, okay, fine. I, went, I never got my 100 on 100 in all the subjects. So I don't really need, need to put in any effort. I have no interest in developing myself. Why did the teacher, first of all, give that privilege so that now the pressure would be off and the child can actually work towards, uh, you know, reaching his full potential? The teacher was giving the child a second chance. But if the child says, no, I don't really want the second chance. I just wanted the marks. I just wanted to go to the next grade. I didn't really care about reaching my full potential. So if the child uh, does not fulfill the purpose for which the teacher gave that second chance, then there is no second chance left to be had, right? Uh, because if that, if that child is just lazy and you know just comes and sits over there, brings a storybook along and just sits in the class and you know reads the story uh, while the teacher is teaching, then now uh, where's the point? The teacher gave a privilege. The child doesn't want the privilege. So it would no longer apply. And um, it is something like that, even when it comes to this, uh, this free gift of salvation that you know Christ is offering us. And uh, Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10 uh, make that very clear. Uh, now, of course, we do not want to get into that because that would become a separate subject by itself. But in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about people who have, you know, uh, tasted this new salvation life that, you know, Christ has offering. And uh, so very clearly in Hebrews chapter 6, um, uh, it, it, uh, in verse 4, it talks about people who have tasted the heavenly gift. It talks about people who have shared in the Holy Spirit. Uh, it says that they, in verse 5, 6, 5, it says, they have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come. So these are all, this is talking about people, it's talking about believers who have, um, you know, received the Holy Spirit and the salvation that he is offering. Uh, so they have walked into all of those things, but then uh, they have chosen, you know, uh, to fall away. Uh, that would be verse six, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter six, verse uh, verse six. Yeah, verse six, uh, Hebrews six six. And then have fallen away since on their way they are crucifying again the Son of God and are holding him up to contempt. And um, um, so it says that such people, for such people, there is only judgment. That would be in your Hebrews chapter ten, um, where it says. Uh, in verse 26, Hebrews 10, 26, for if we willfully persist in sin after having received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment. That's all that's left for the person. Why? Because the, they did not want the second chance. Uh, God is freely offering it. And in fact, when uh, God freely offered, you know, he even gave a deposit, a guarantee to ensure that he's not bluffing. He actually means it. He really is offering us eternal life. Uh, so it's like, let us say, you know, I make a promise to Jeffina saying that, you know, I'm going to be giving you uh, five crores uh, of, uh, you know, uh, uh, money. Uh, so five crore rupees. Um, OK, those of us who are from other nations, crore is not a very Indian term, right? Uh, I'm not exactly sure what expression. Anyway, just think, think of a very large amount of money, OK? Uh, more money than I ever will have. Uh, so think of that. Uh, so I'm offering Jeffina that amount. 
and uh, she looks at me rather skeptically thinking my goodness a rather big offer will this lady really come through so you know uh, just to assure her and see see i am actually going to be giving this to you uh, but right now just so that you will believe me you know i'm uh, right now you know uh, uh, putting down uh, this many uh, lakhs of rupees you know in your name if this is a deposit this is a guarantee that i will come through on my promise you will get the this huge amount which i have promised you and i'm giving you this deposit i'm giving you this guarantee uh, as an assurance that i'm actually going to keep my word and so that's basically what the lord did for us he says i'm going to give you my spirit the holy spirit himself i'm going to give him to you because i really genuinely am going to make you part of my family you know when you, when, you, when we all gather out there in heaven you are actually going to be part of the royal family you're going to be part of my family so he so it's like a really big thing that he's promising so just you know so that we can know that this is really meant for us he is giving the holy spirit as a guarantee as a deposit now we have it in our hands we have tasted of the holy spirit it says we have tasted of the powers of the age to come all that has just been offered free so that we can um you know enjoy this privilege of being like jesus to become like him to reflect the beauty of his glory and on that day when we are all lined up you know for the family photo uh, the angels will look at jesus they will look at us and they'll say oh wow you know they are uh, brothers and sisters because they all look alike they should not say oh my goodness look at jesus he in all his glory and look at that thing which is standing next to him that will not be the case because his goal for us is that we should be like jesus now if someone says oh i don't want all this jesus will be like fine you know it's your free ch free choice you don't want it you don't want the second chance you don't want to be made like christ you don't want to be part of my family fine this this other place called hell where you don't really have to be part of my family at all you know so it's a, it's a conscious choice which people make whether they want to be on god's side or they want to be on the other side they have the freedom to choose so like it says in john 10 whatever god has put in jesus hands he really wants to hold on to that he doesn't want to lose even one person who has been given to him but if that person says i don't want to be in your hands i want to go out to the other side of the fence and live in sin I mean, that is you know your choice so yes uh, uh, salvation can be lost uh, simply because you do not want this awesome privileges which are being given to you so that's a conscious choice which a person would you know but the holy spirit would keep warning that person give them every opportunity possible to enjoy what has been offered to them but uh, you know if they make that deliberate choice and say no enough i really don't want it i want the ticket to heaven but i don't want any part of god or holiness well heaven is all about god and holiness right i mean so if you don't want that then you know you need to go to the other side so it's it would be something like that uh, okay so yes salvation can be uh, lost um uh, yeah uh, yeah go ahead and ask your question but you know let's not get too much into this topic because that kind of diverts <laughs> just away from what we are discussing ha go ahead tell okay pastor uh, no i just have one the one last question so there is a verse in matthew that says uh, uh, where jesus uh, was preaching and he used to say if you don't say like you you kept calling me like lord lord you prophesied in my name we cast demons in your name but i will say like i never knew you you were an evil doer you're not part of the kingdom of god so even in that case does it mean they they lost the salvation or uh, it's it's a total different topic so just wanted to uh it just says that they were using the name of jesus and they were able to achieve a lot so maybe it was the power of uh, the name of jesus which was causing those uh, you know demons to flee so don't know whether those people were true followers of jesus or not at that point of time uh, so uh, if they were not really people who had chosen to take up their cross and follow him then they were just simply using the name and this power in the name of jesus so in such in such a case uh, they would just be people who never really belonged to him at all they were just using his name and his name works and uh, so he will say yeah you used my name you got whatever benefits you could out of that now you know uh, but I, but you never really made any commitment to me i never chose to be part of my family 
so he would say you know you have to go and join the people on the other side because you were never part of my family so over there is he speaking specifically about believers as such uh, don't know but he is talking about a bunch of people who discovered that this power in the name of jesus and began to use it for their own purposes uh, but they never made that personal commitment to him to be part of his family and when you want to be part of his family you got to be like his son jesus you got to take up your cross you got to follow him share in his sufferings and then you will share in his glory you know when the family photo is taken you're there in the family standing next to god the father and jesus so uh, that is something that uh, um, uh, these people in, the, in that particular verse don't know whether they even thought of all of that they just saw that this power in the name of jesus and probably be began to use it for making profit for making money maybe so yeah um thank you yeah, Pastor. yeah. uh so moving on uh, to other things that other questions that can be asked um yeah uh, how will living a holy life make a difference in our practical experience uh, well one thing that we saw is that when we lead a holy life we will be able to possess and uh, come into the inheritance that we are meant to have uh, and uh, uh, obadiah 117 is the verse that you know is quoted in your notes where it says on mount zion will be deliverance it will be holy and jacob will possess his inheritance so in the place of holiness you will be able to possess your inheritance you will be able to get all that christ has reserved for you you know it talks about the the riches of holiness and the riches of uh, the spiritual uh, riches which are ours in christ right so we are very very rich in christ now you can have all of those spiritual riches only if you are in a place of holiness because it is only on mount zion the place of holiness that you will be able to possess your inheritance um and uh, Mount Zion is in fact compared to the church because in Hebrews chapter 12 verses 22 to 23 uh, uh, Mount Zion is, uh, is, is described as the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. So um, in the place of holiness, in the church uh, where people are gathered whose names have been written in the book of life in that place if you are living in that place then you will be able to possess your inheritance on the other hand if you are living with the world then um, you don't get the benefits of uh, you know uh, the inheritance which is actually meant to be yours in christ uh, another practical um, benefit of uh, of holiness first uh, timothy 4 7 to 8 it says godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come so uh, there's this thing about godliness not only will it be of use to you in heaven you know as in you you know you you gain entry into heaven by uh, being holy by making use of the second chance that has been given no it's not just that godliness is, has value for all things including the present life so you can actually have a better life on this earth if you are living in holiness. So very, very practical value. Okay. Um, uh, also, another practical uh, um, uh, you know, benefit of holiness, um, we become more Christ-like. Uh, and uh, Second Peter 1, 3 to 9 talks about that. You know, uh, that's your passage where it says, add to your faith goodness, uh, to goodness, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control to self control perseverance so you keep adding on one uh, you know uh, attribute to the other and when you do that it says in verse second peter 1 verse 8 it says for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus so we choose to be uh, holy and we choose to add uh, you know uh, um, fair, uh, goodness to our faith and then to goodness we add knowledge and to knowledge self-control we we in increasing measure we keep uh, adding these things to our daily life so that uh, down the line 
we will become more and more effective more and more productive uh, in the way we live uh, so those are some practical uh, benefits of holiness. You know, all these things are there in your notes. Uh, pastor has taken great care to write down these things in, you know, in beautiful detail. So it would really help if you can, you know, look at your notes later. Because in a lecture, we can only just uh, cover some things and then inspire the students, you know, to, you know, walk in Christ. And we leave it at that. Uh, but then, you know, to get into every little point, uh, that may not be possible in the class, but please do go and look at the notes. So another thing, question which is raised in the notes is uh, how important are externals, style of clothes we wear uh, and all of that to being holy? So how important are externals when it comes to holiness? Um, so of course, we are familiar with 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, where the Lord says to Samuel, uh, you know, people look at the outward appearance, but the God, uh, but God looks at the heart. Uh, so, um, whether we wear jewels or not, uh, whether we wear um, um, uh, beautiful clothes or whether we wear simple clothes, um, God does not look at uh, look so much at those outward details because He is very interested in the heart. Does this person have a heart which really appreciates the second chance that I, that has been given does this person have a hunger for my presence does this person uh, uh, love being with me reading my word uh, you know god looks at those things and if we have that hunger he says okay i'm really going to help this person to be more holy because they really want it they really enjoy it uh, so depending on our hunger level he will give he will give he will help us to become more like christ okay so he's not so much interested in uh, whether you're wearing simple clothes or whether you're wearing you know nice pretty bright clothes um uh, he's not really in, that much interested in whether you're using jewelry or not using jewelry so externals don't matter much to him however one thing he looks out for us in the externals is this is this person expressing holiness so whatever you do have on the external in the in the externals are those externals expressing holiness or not so that becomes a question and um, you know uh, we could maybe look very briefly at first timothy chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 uh, just to see uh, what god expects when it comes to externals um, so if someone could read out for us first timothy chapter 2 verses 8 to 10 please First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 to 10. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands and prayers without anger or disputing. I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Okay, so... Um... You know, First Timothy has been written to Timothy, who is the leader of the Church of Ephesus. Uh, so, um, based on the epistles, you know, based on the letters, we kind of know how things were at Ephesus. Uh, so, it looks like the people over here in this particular uh, Ephesus church uh, were not expressing holiness in their externals. The men, when they come over there, they come over there to show off how knowledgeable they are. And so they get into these debates, uh, you know, to show off how much Bible knowledge they have and how well they can argue their case. And they're not so much interested, I think, in uh, really getting across the truth. All they want is to show how good I am at, you know, presenting my case and how well I can talk. And so um, the advice that is given uh, by Paul to the you know male uh, people in the congregation he says you know uh, what is more important is the lifting up of holy hands without anger or disputing so over here the word holy hands is like a symbolic uh, phrase which is talking about um, conduct how are you con con you know uh, uh, conducting yourself um, 
are you full of uh, you know rivalry and competition and anger and uh, uh, you know wanting to show off your superiority if that is what your your hands are uh, then uh, it's pointless so you should be lifting up holy hands in the presence of god that god will admire that god will respond to not your showing off of your knowledge and your greatness the women on the other hand i mean at that time they probably were not that educated as the men you know when it came to uh, when it comes to you know knowledge and so they come over there with their uh, uh, plus point uh, you know they come with their beauty they come with their clothes to, sh to show off how pretty they are or how attractive they are and you know try to win people's um, you know liking through that so while men come over there to show off their knowledge women are coming over there to show off their clothes and their you know physical appearance and uh, so they come over here to the church service having uh, gold braided into their hair and they have pearls and all of that which is like kind of overdoing it a little bit you know if you're going for a wedding maybe you would want to dress up but then just for a church service coming over there you know that fully decked out uh, so um, you know so Paul is saying, what is your emphasis? Are you all about, uh, you know, clothes and uh, uh, showing off? What about good deeds? How many of you are wearing good deeds? You know, because that uh, is what God is looking for. So when it comes to externals, your externals, are they expressing holiness? Are they expressing a love for God, wanting to serve him, uh, you know, um, so as long as your externals are expressing that, go ahead and you know be as fancy as you want. You want to wear all your gold and come to the church? Fine, go ahead. I mean, that's that's all right. But is your conduct, is your behavior, uh, are the choices that you're, you're making, are those things reflecting the holiness of God? Are they reflecting a hunger of God? So you know, it really doesn't matter. Some people really like wearing pretty things. Um, I mean, um, I am not too, I mean, that that's not my, uh, you know, area of interest. Uh, but I've seen people, you know, who uh, always wear nail polish, which matches their clothes. And I think, oh, wow, look at that person, you know, they, so some people enjoy that. And I, and I think it's nice. God gave them that kind of a personality type, you know, where they, and not everyone should look drab and average, right? I mean, there should be people who enjoy such things. So I think uh, that's just part of personality type. So be who you are, but when it comes to conduct, when it comes to choices, when it comes to uh, the, you know the, the the way we treat people, when it comes to those things, is that reflecting holiness? If it is, then uh, that's more than enough for the Lord. Please go ahead and you know wear whatever you want and just enjoy yourselves as long as whatever you're wearing does not bring dishonor to his name never never should it do that because we are representatives of the lord so as long as it whatever you're wearing is bringing honor to the lord you know just go ahead and enjoy yourself wear uh, clothes as bright as you wish them to be yeah um then um yeah another thing maybe to keep in mind even as we are dwelling on this point uh we should never judge people's level of holiness um, simply because uh, you know we would probably get it wrong we do not know everything about a person we do not know what's going on in the person's heart so it would be dangerous it would be risky for us to pass judgment on the level of holiness which a person has uh, only the lord knows how holy each person is uh, so it would not be good for us to judge. Uh, so there's this one passage which I really like, um, you know, and we could uh, look at that. It's also there in your notes. Um, Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12, which is like a huge chunk. So we will not read every single verse, but, you know, it really is making a point uh, regarding how important it is not to judge people. Um, so Romans 14. Uh, verse 1 it says accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters okay so um 
we may i may have one interpretation of the scriptures and then you know you may say no 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 this verse is actually saying that and then uh, you know we may want to debate on that and have a discussion uh, that's totally fine but it's not really so important uh, whether you know your opinion is superior or my opinion is superior uh, because in the end um, all of us are trying to um, you know understand the scriptures and trying to apply them and practice them to the best that we can okay so uh, so uh, it says in verse 3 it says uh, um, must not judge the one who does for god has accepted them god has accepted us because he has seen in us this hunger uh, to know him uh, to grow in him to love him and on the basis of that he has accepted us so when it comes to um, matters of interpretation and our opinions and all of that uh, it is good to have our own opinions it is good for us to be to present our opinions and try to persuade someone else you know to come on to our side and say you know i too you know believe in this so it's it's nice to you know engage in all of that but um, whether we treat a person uh, as acceptable or not based on that would not be good so it says over here in verse 3 it says uh, we must not treat with com contempt you know those who are not holding on to uh, our views and uh, by because god has accepted them so we also better accept them we can't you know treat them with contempt just because they hold a different view um so if one person says you know the bible says this about fasting and that is why i fast every single month and i do it for this many days and i do it in this particular way um and then you know if you say ah no 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 you know jesus said uh, you know when uh, when the when the bridegroom is with the with his people then you don't really need to fast we have the holy spirit within us so we don't have to fast like as if we are all ritual bound and so you try to make your case and you look down on the other person and you treat them with contempt because they have a different view of fasting than the one that you hold on to god is not going to like that because god has accepted that person god sees the hunger in that person and he sees that the motive behind that fasting which that person is doing that person is doing that fasting to reach out to god in his own way let him do it who are you to get between him and his god you know so um it says over here don't judge people just because your interpretation of scripture is one thing and maybe they hold a slightly different view don't judge them don't treat them with contempt um, because god has accepted them and there's something else that god says over here in these verses you know through speaking through paul and i really like that it says in verse 4 and 5 it says who are you to judge someone else's servant to their own master servants stand or fall and they will stand in case you're thinking oh that person is going to fall definitely it says here they will stand for the lord is able to make them stand so when it comes to differences between believers don't think that you're superior don't think that you're the one who knows more um, uh, and don't think oh the other person will definitely fall i am strong they are weak no it says here the lord is able to make them stand because he can see their heart he can see the love they have for him and he knows that they really want to honor him so he will cause them to stand they don't need uh, your meddling they don't need you to go and show off how superior you are you know in your knowledge and all of that and um then you know it goes on to talk about um each of us should be fully convinced in our own mind so you know if you have a certain opinion about you know um uh, how holiness should be lived you know you, you you may say okay um you know people should wear jewels not wear jewels only then you know that shows that they are holy you know so whatever you're convinced in your mind about go ahead and do it why because one person the other person is doing what they are doing uh, they are doing it for the lord okay that it says that in verse 6 and also in uh, yeah in verse 6 it says whoever regards one day as special does so to the lord whoever abstains does so to the lord all these things that you're doing it you're doing it for the lord 
to honor him each person is doing it in their own way so if someone feels that they are honoring god by not wearing jewels let them be no on the other hand if you feel that you want to know really dress up smartly and go to church because that is your way of honoring god please go ahead and do that because each person is reaching out to the lord in their own way and it says in verse 7 for none of us none of us lives for ourselves alone you know if we live we live for the lord so we are doing all this for him so as long as he is being honored and glorified let that person express their holiness in their own way as long as we are not going against the precepts and principles set down in the bible that of course is the final you know standard so as long as someone is not going deliberately against what has been taught in scripture let each person have the freedom to express their holiness in their own way do not judge them do not treat them with contempt because god has accepted them and god is quite able to make them stand so you don't have to pass judgment on them and interfere you know so is what it says over here in this passage so i really like the way you know so um, so forcefully right in the face you know uh, uh, you know paul is saying this uh, so because sometimes we think oh only if people are exactly like me if they think like me then they will stand but god you know god is saying over here i'm quite capable of making my people stand you know your meddling and your interference is not required uh, so um, so that's why it says in verse 12 so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to god okay so do not be judgmental when it comes to such things uh, now another valid question which we can no deal with uh, uh, regarding holiness what advice would you give to young people faced with a fear of being bullied for living a holy life and you know we all know right there is no easy answer for this uh, because yes bullying will happen um, simply because we are different from the world and uh, the world picks on people who are different if you're part of the flock you know they accept you uh, but then you know you you stand apart and you're different and moreover because you're standing apart it shows them they know uh, that you are living a higher better uh, standard that will automatically kind of make them feel ashamed uh, deep down and so in fact they will want to take out their anger on you uh, so so bullying is going to happen there is no avoiding it uh, but at least we can have this um, assurance that something good is coming out of it uh, because this is what it says in uh, John chapter 12 verses 42 to 43 if we could have someone read out John chapter 12 verses 42 to 43 John chapter 12 verse 42 to 43 Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith, for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Okay, so um, we will be bullied if we choose holiness, uh, but we will receive praise from God, and that is more important than praise from people. In the first place you know praise from people is a very fickle thing one day they are they are for you the next day they'll be against you so uh, it's not really going to last even uh, so but on the other hand you know if you have god's approval god is one person who stand by you even when you fail i mean even when you're at your worst he loves you and he still holds out hope for you that your life can be changed that it can be turned around if you can just come back to him so he's that kind of a god so utterly faithful so uh, it is tough no one likes to be bullied no one likes to be mocked uh, but you will have the praise of the lord and it says you know in first samuel uh, chapter 2 verse 30 um, uh, it says in uh, the last portion of first samuel 2 30 those who honor me i will honor but those who despise me will be disdained it's like God you know, would look down on them and say, my goodness, this person doesn't even uh, want to acknowledge me. You know, they try to hide. They try to hide me in front of other people. So God would not have much of a, you know, uh, opinion of such a person. So he says, those who despise me will be disdained. Uh, so we choose to have God's praise. We choose to be honored by him. 
more than uh, by the world. It is a tough sacrifice to make, uh, but there's no getting around it. Uh, so, so we stand up for holiness, even if people are going to be mocking us because of it. Uh, but there's also another side to it uh, because you know of the kind of example that we are setting for the people. Uh, First Peter chapter two, verses eleven to twelve, uh, where it says, "Though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God." You know, so um, many of them they may be mocking you, but they also see the standards for which you are standing. And they see that you are doing that because you honor this God of yours. And somewhere down the line, you know, when some hard times come, they may reach out to this God because you gave this God so much honor, and you considered this God so special that you were able to that you know, that you were willing to stand up for Him in spite of all the mockery. You know, that day on in their time of trouble, they it may they, you know it may remind them of the stand that you took for your God, and they, they may think. Oh, maybe this God is really something. Let me reach out to Him. So, the example that you set for them um, may actually make a divine difference, you know, uh, someday down the line. So, it is so important for us to hold on to Him, even when people are mocking us, because uh, outwardly they are mocking, but inwardly there is some information getting across. That you are standing up for someone who is worthy of standing up for, and uh, so someday God may reach out to them, and they may respond because of the example that you set. So, uh, what you are putting up with uh, actually may have, you know, divine implications. So go ahead, even though it is tough, go ahead and hold on to the Lord and continue to set an example of holy living. Even though people are mocking, because who knows through what you did, uh, one day a person may be added to heaven. Uh, you know, a life may be transformed just because you were able to, you know, willing to stand up uh, to all the abuse and still uh, represent Christ. So it's worth it. Uh, it's worth it to go through that. Um, and uh, yeah, the same thing is said even in Matthew chapter five, verses thirteen to sixteen. Where it says, "Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your uh, Father." So, when we do this, when we choose to continue holding on to the Lord in spite of uh, uh, persecution, in spite of mockery, when we hold on to Him, the Father will get glorified. Another thing that is mentioned in your notes is um, sometimes we feel guilty, condemned, and unworthy. Uh, to come before God, uh, if we, you know, if we have sinned, so how do we overcome our sense of condemnation? Um, yeah, we are called to a life of holiness. We are very much aware of it now. Uh, but when we fail, when we fail to honor God and we sin. And we feel so ashamed. How do we overcome that? How do we get back on track? Is the question being asked over here? Um, so maybe we could begin by looking at First John chapter one, verses eight to ten. Highly comforting verses. So if someone could read out First John one eight to ten. First John chapter one, verse eight to ten. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make Him out to be a liar, and His word has no place in our lives. Okay, so um. Now, when John is writing this letter, he basically writes this letter because there are people who are who are going around saying, uh, you know, now that I have uh, become a follower of Christ, I am righteous, and because I am righteous, whatever I do, you cannot call it sin. It's not sin. I'm beyond sin. I cannot sin. I never sin. So they were coming and going around saying this, uh, you know, rather uh, false thing, and they were living bad lives and pretending that they are righteous, 
uh, because Christ has you know granted them his righteousness. So John clarifies in his letter and explains and says, you know, um, positionally we already have the righteousness of Christ, but when it comes to our actually growing into that you know Christ likeness, it's a daily process and we are still growing into that. So do not have to you don't have to pretend that you're not sinning. When you're sinning, admit that you have sinned. Go to the Lord. He will forgive you. And it says he will purify us from all unrighteousness. So not only does he just forgive us, he also begins to purify that uncleanness which, you know, which set into us when we committed that act of sin. So not only are we just forgiven, we are also cleansed from that thing which took hold of us. Uh, from that thing which kind of gained the hold on us, you know, that sinful thing. He begins to clean us of its influence um, so that we are washed away from that uh, unrighteousness and we will have a longing for the things of God. We will have a love for him. So it's a very good thing to go to the Lord immediately when we sin, you know, rather than feeling guilty and avoiding him. Because when we do that, Satan takes advantage of the situation. So better to quickly go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I have sinned. And, uh, you know, if you could please forgive me, he forgives us and he purifies us from that act of sin, you know, and all the dirt that it brought in. Uh, he purifies us. So it is so important to go to him immediately. Um, and it says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, whoever conceals their sins, does not prosper but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy so the lord in his mercy will forgive and he will also begin to purify us from that unrighteousness so that you know we will be able to uh, walk in him um, so the first step is to confess and repent and return to god and then uh, the next thing would be to embrace god's gift of righteousness uh, that would be Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2. If we could have someone read out Romans 5, 1 to 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 to 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, this, uh, These two verses talk about the position that we have in Christ. Uh, what is the position that we have in Christ? We have been justified through faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. What is this uh, position of grace in which we now stand? It's a position where we have peace with God. God, from, uh, the, at that moment when we made a commitment to the Lord Jesus and say, okay, Lord, now onwards, I choose to follow you. You will be my master now onwards. At that moment of salvation, you know, when uh, uh, when the Father imparted the Holy Spirit to us, from that moment on, God has just got one attitude towards us, an attitude of peace, acceptance, approval. That's not going to change. God is not going to be having mood swings on a daily basis. Uh, you know, today you 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 mess up, you you fall into sin, and God doesn't become angry. And tomorrow, you know, you are very careful and you don't commit any sin, and then God is happy and He loves you once again. No, no mood swings with God. It's one stable attitude that He now holds towards you as a believer, where He is at peace with you, and this attitude of peace towards you will continue until that day you know when you finally say no i want to walk in darkness i want to go back to the world that I, I want my ticket to heaven of course but i do not want to walk with the lord because i do not want to be like him i'm not interested in him till that day when you go back when you, when you up to that day god's attitude towards you is just an attitude of peace so when we sin against God, it's not that he suddenly is now very, very angry. No, 
he is still at having an attitude of peace towards you and he is saying come back to me because i can repair this i can take care of this i will cleanse your sin i will purify you from the unrighteousness i will put you back on track and things will go on our relationship will continue growing you will become stronger you will have victory nothing to get you know upset about yes you should not have fallen but now that you have done this foolish thing learn from the experience do not repeat it get back on your feet god is just on your side so it's not like he's angry so you don't have to feel that oh how can i go back to him now he must be really mad at me he's not mad at you he has taken a position a divine position that now he is going to have an attitude of peace towards you because you have been justified through faith okay so it is you who feel the guilt from your side because you god gave you a second chance and you took it lightly you went back into sin not appreciating what god has done for you and so you feel ashamed and it's good to feel ashamed but we don't have to stay over there in that position of guilt because that will give open the door to satan uh, so the holy spirit he brings conviction into our hearts so when you're feeling really uncomfortable after committing a sin that is conviction it's the holy spirit saying look look where i have placed you and look where you are you know wallowing you are not meant to be here in this pit you are meant to be with me seated you know with christ in the heavenly places that is the position i gave you and here you are in the mud pit get up you know get back get back to me i'll wash you clean come and sit with me in the heavenlies like you were seated before so you feel this conviction inside and you feel really uncomfortable and god is saying i'm putting this conviction in your heart to make you get up from the pit be disgusted with it the way i am disgusted with the pit come back come back and sit in the heavenlies with me be seated with christ is all jesus is saying satan on the other hand will start bringing in condemnation he will start saying oh you will never amount to anything you will never become holy the whole world may become holy but you are one person who will never become holy it's not possible for you so you may as well give up now and all of that that is your condemnation package it comes from satan so the satan is the one who will make you feel that you are no good how on earth can god be pleased with someone like you uh so if you go back to him he's just going to be like so fed up and he's going to think like oh she's back after doing all the things that she does she's back okay fine i have to accept her i will accept her and so so satan starts telling you all this drivel it is satan who puts all these thoughts in your mind scripture does not say any of those things if you were to read your bible read the scriptures god says once the person is justified all that god wants for that person is to make him like christ so when you get into the mud heap and you you know you wallow in that rot god says get up come back to me give me a chance to wash you clean i will do that come back and sit with me on you know be seated in the holy place uh, in in uh, with christ in the heavenly places and you know uh, be who you are meant to be and that's all life goes on god keeps taking you to higher levels there is no need for this whole thing of you know being guilty and condemned and thinking oh now i am beyond hope oh now god will not love me oh now god has to put up with me all those things are things from satan's head you don't have to accept that rot those lies just stand on scripture which says that you have been justified and because you have been justified he will just simply wash you clean put you back on track and you can go continue your walk with the lord so when we do something sinful accept the fact that what you have done is wrong you should not have taken advantage of the lord's mercy and kindness but having admitted that come back to him he will wash you clean and move on from there so romans 8:15 is so important for us in our daily walk with the lord because like john warns us we are going to be sinning we have not reached perfection yet so we will be sinning but romans 8:15 is so so very important for us if someone could read out that verse please
my students is anyone there romans 815 please romans chapter 8 verse 15 so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves instead you received god's spirit when he adopted you as his own children now we call him abba father so you do not have to live in fear do not say oh how can i go back to god i committed this sin no you've been given the right to call him abba father you can go back to your abba father and you know like any father with a dirty little child he takes the child to the bathroom you know uh, sets the kid next to the water and washes him clean that's what a father does so never think that you are some kind of a slave you are his child and all he wants for you is to become like your elder brother jesus christ okay so you can always have that assurance and confidence in the lord all right so these are just the things that we could cover in the class um uh, if you can go through the notes uh, you can you can get into each little point and you know just spend time reflecting on on those verses uh, so because it is not possible to cover all of the points uh, but you know please do go through chapter 5 uh, which is basically what we touched upon today um so let's just close with a word of prayer Lord, we just thank you so much for the things that you have spoken to us through your word today. Now, Lord, even as we walk in these things, you empower us by your Holy Spirit so that we can genuinely lead a holy life. Help us, O Lord, to stop being double-minded, to set both our feet firmly on this side of the fence, on your side, and choose to walk with you. And even as we do that, even as we learn to walk in holiness, you, O oh Lord, guide us and help us and strengthen our feet. Give us that um, hunger to really love you, to long for your honor, to long for your praise and your approval. Lord, make us like Christ so that we will have his perspective, his hungers, his tastes, um, uh, his entire worldview. Please make us, Lord, like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much for sticking on till the end of the class. Uh, so we'll meet again next week. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarita. Thank you. Thank you. Well,